first episode of Talk That Talk with Fallon and D-Lab. We up in here trying to get this podcast started and have a great discussion just about social issues, sports, anything that's been going on right now during this pandemic while everybody's been stuck in the house and just starting to get back out a little bit. How you been doing, D-Lab? I'm doing good. It's a whole lot to talk about. 2020 has been a year to remember. Whether you want to look at it as a good year or a bad year, most would say bad, but a whole lot's been going on in 2020. Yeah, that's to say the least. But let's get started talking about the NBA. You know, we hadn't had sports in a few months, really since March. And, you know, we were in a hot race between NBA teams trying to compete for playoff spots. And now it's just transitioned to where they're trying to get the NBA going again. I call it the Kobe year because we lost them at the beginning of the year. But, you know, I'm a Lakers fan, so I'm always rooting to see what they can do. But what, what do you think about this whole new format they try to do to get the NBA going again? Well, first things first, I'm not sure if they're going to play uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, obviously, there are a lot of guys who feel uh, uncertain about the safety of themselves with COVID going on, and especially the numbers in Florida, which are very high. Uh, and especially around that Orlando, Kissimmee area. Then also um, we have the social justice stuff going on and people don't want to look as though um, they're naive to what's going on and they're inconsiderate. So they don't want to just jump back into sports like there's not a very serious issue going on. And then you have things like Trevor Ariza who said, you know, he just spends time, he only has his son for a certain period of the year. uh, and He doesn't want to miss that whole month, month and a half uh, when he only gets the summers. And I think there are other players in the NBA that are in a similar situations. So a lot of people have uh, decisions to make by Wednesday. So it'll be very interesting to see what the final numbers come in or guys who do want to play and guys who don't want to play. I guess more more important than guys that don't want to play. Yeah, that's interesting you brought that up because I was looking at the Florida COVID numbers and they're slowly creeping up. So that's causing some concern right now. Just as of yesterday, 3,494 new cases of positive COVID people down in Florida. So that's a huge concern and 17 plus deaths as of yesterday. So with those numbers, I see the concern, you know, having family members down there playing basketball is a contact sport. So it's going to be a risk, even though as fans, I would love to see it go on, but it's just trying to see how they can do it in a safe way. Uh, But that's causing some concern. I saw Trevor Ariza talking about that. Uh, today, you know, that's the importance. He has a son one month out of the year, and that's important to him to where he's willing to risk about one one million or one point eight million in salary just not to come back and play. But it's other players like Kyrie Irving, you know, his concerns, which I thought were a little iffy at first because he wasn't even coming back to play uh, anyway. But he thought that this was a huge platform, especially with the social injustices we're seeing right now in the U.S., you know, with Black Lives Matter, that whole movement and just trying to keep the momentum going and taking the focus away. He didn't want to take the focus away from that movement by playing a game that he's not even playing. What what are your thoughts? What did you think about that? Kyrie stepping up and trying to say, make his comments about coming back and playing. Well, a lot of people think um, and a lot of I have some NBA guys who have given me some thoughts on um, what Kyrie's true intentions are. Um, and a lot of people think his true intentions are trying to block LeBron James from getting another championship. Whether that's true or false, I, I don't know. Um, but I think the, the overall effect that it has had, um, where it's brought awareness to the possibility that playing can take away from the movement, mm-hmm. was important. And, and regardless of what his intentions were, Um, I like the fact that he did it. And I think Avery Bradley put some stuff on paper uh, that's very realistic and has made some demands or uh, uh, um, some negotiables um, that I think are are very important and valuable. Um, He wants more black general managers. Um, He wants to have more black owned businesses um, in in arenas on game day. Um, You know, the opportunity for them to make more money, which I thought was very fair and very valid. Uh, and just to bring awareness um, to what's going on and try to equal out in their arena or their platform. Um, so Kyrie started out um, talking about he just wanted to be able to come in the arena as and go go and come as he pleases. Could he drink alcohol? And then it turned into something that became very serious and very important. Um, so the fact that he brought awareness again, um, I appreciate it. Uh, and hopefully 
uh, the stuff that everybody put on paper will get done by the NBA higher ups. Yeah, I thought that was huge trying to start a coalition amongst players. You know, the, the league is predominantly black anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so they have a voice. And I think that's one of the rare leagues where the players actually have the voice and the owners listen, or at least the commissioner does. So that's very important. NBA players have always, you know, stood strong and grounded in a huge platform for social injustice, wearing shirts during the seasons and just bringing acknowledgement to it on that platform. That's been greatly appreciated. But I do get that aspect of what Kyrie's saying. Right now, it's a huge momentum in the Black Lives Matter movement. And it's so important to continue that, to bring awareness so we could try and, you know, affect change. And that's that's been huge in 2020 right now when you're just seeing the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, Ahmaud Arbery here in Atlanta, and the most recent, Rayshard Brooks, um, whose funeral is actually tomorrow. So that's just, hey, RIP Rayshard Brooks. You know, just a sad, sad incident. 27-year-old man loses his life, wife and kids, uh, just over something that just could have been avoided. Um, but that's a whole nother discussion for a whole nother day. That's um, a whole all by itself. It is. But it's so important. We have to bring awareness, even though I, I want the NBA to come back. But I would say this, if they do come back, they got a cool platform in that little bubble down in Orlando where they would have, you know, great housing, meals, even those special rings they'll wear just to say if they even have symptoms of COVID within a three hour period or something crazy. So I want to transition and talk about the WNBA who's trying to also start their season um, next month. And they'll be in Bradenton, Florida at IMG trying to create their own bubble. But it's some discrepancies or you see some huge differences between what the NBA is providing for their players compared to what the WNBA will be able to provide for their players. Um, So what are your thoughts about that one right there? Before I get into that, I want to make sure that, you know, I want the NBA to come back because I'm a basketball fan and I love it. But what I don't want to happen is it become a distraction from what's going on, because in my heart of hearts, I feel like. If the NBA is playing games, mm-hmm. meaningful games, there will be less protesting. Um, there will be less posting on social media. There will be less news coverage about it. Uh, and I'm just really concerned and worried that things will go back to how they were before, um, which is, you know, we just get caught up in our daily lives with work, family, sports. And it takes away from things that we should have dealt with a long time ago. The WNBA. And I'm going to play devil's advocate, so I don't want any women's basketball fans to get upset with me. You know me. You know I go to women's basketball games. My dad was a women's basketball coach. I have absolutely no issues with women's basketball. I love it. Love it. Watch it all and the you're time. And gir- you're a girl dad. Exactly. But playing devil's advocate in this particular scenario, the reason that the NBA is going to get uh, more money and a more um, intensive bubble is because they generate so much more revenue um, through jersey sales, ticket sales, TV deals. Um, Unfortunately, the WNBA has not picked up and gotten to even close to the level of the NBA. Um, So their funding, which comes from the NBA, uh, is going to be less. Right. um, But I do think that they are putting them in a situation. I don't think either situation is safe. Let's just start there. I don't think the bubble is going to exist because – Um, I think that the guys are going to be bringing family members in. Uh, Let's just be honest. The the guys are going to be bringing girls in. They're going to be leaving. They're going to be going out. They're not going to stay and follow the rules. Rich basketball players are rule breakers. They're not going to, no one can tell grown men who have a lot of money. You can't leave this facility. Like it's, it's not even realistic. Anybody Mm -hmm. who thinks it's realistic is, is fooling themselves. So I think both of them are unsafe. But the women are not getting the food, the meal prep, which I think is very important as far as um, obviously as an athlete, whatever you put in your body um, is what you can get out of your body. And, you know, they're high powered machines. Their bodies are. So they need to have good food. And I I think it's unfair that they're going to get a lot lot less of food. And I think it's also unfair that they're going to have them with roommates when the NBA players are going to have their own individualized rooms, even though. For them to put out what hotels particular teams were going to be in in the NBA. Did you see that? Yeah, I did. Why would they do that? I don't know. 
so fans can just swarm and find it. Yeah, that's going to be a huge issue, too. I don't know why they would publicize that. That goes against the whole bubble philosophy. Yeah. I mean, let's just let's just target one group. Any any girl that's a gold digger that's looking for an NBA player now has a roadmap to where they're going to be. And more than likely, their family is not going to be. Right. So that, I mean, it just didn't make any sense to post that and put that out there. It didn't. But I, I, I'll say this, too, being devil's advocate on the other side. I'm sure some of those players that would not mind for some of those gold diggers to make it to those hotels and find it and locating them, if that's the situation, too. Unfortunately. Um, yeah, that's unfortunate. But that I know that was some of the players' concerns, too. Like, you don't want to be housed in a bubble when you have so much freedom, so much money. You travel from city to city, you know, going out to clubs. This is a whole different ball game, a new age you know, in the game to where you have to pretty much stay in and find your own source of entertainment. But that, I mean, they're going to have everything. The NBA players will have everything accessible to them. I get what you're saying with, with the revenue that the WNBA generates. It's not to the level of the NBA, mm -hmm. but it's still some parameters just to create safety parameters. And then right. like, if I know for some of the coaches, like they can't even have their spouse there. Like the players, if they have a child, I think accommodations will be made for a guardian or that spouse to be present to help with that child, just to care for that child. But coaches staff, no, it's just you. And you're gone for that amount of time, however long they're going to be there without their loved ones or their family members. So that's going to be pretty tough. And I think with the NBA being able to have or to facilitate having at least immediate family, like a wife, kids, things of that nature to be present, um, I think that's a huge difference in just the psyche and the mindset during this time when you need that level of support when you're going through a rigorous time of playing a sport. I agree. So that's going to be interesting uh, to see how those two leagues are able to work it out, you know, trying to, I assume, trying to work together. But at the same time, they're going two different, uh, two different directions and trying to get their, their leagues or their seasons started up. Um, but I'm a fan. I would love to see both. But I understand if players have concerns or if it just doesn't work out as planned and they can't move forward to. Do you think that the NBA doesn't play, that the WNBA plays? <laughs> well, see, that's another thing. You know, you got, like you said, the salaries that NBA players make, even if they're going to take a hit if they don't play. But in their contracts, for most players, it's spaced out to where they still get some of that money that's guaranteed to them. Hmm. So it's not a huge hit. Whereas WM WNBA players, if they decide not to play, and that the league does not go forward, it's going to be an issue with salaries and benefits. And I know some players that have had some concerns about not wanting to come back because they're uh, concerned about their safety. Then that means that they just lose a season. Um, from what I heard, like say if a player has a two year contract and they decide not to play this season, then the contract just moves to the following season, but you don't get any income for this season. So the, D the WNBA players make so little money as it is right now, that's a huge hit. And then who's to, who's to know if you're even going overseas this season where the bulk of these WNBA players get their income. Um, so that's going to be tough. I think the WNBA needs to play more so than the NBA does. Yeah. Even though we would love to see the NBA in the playoffs. But, but that's safe? the thing. Is it yeah. safe? It's not. It's not. You know, I was people have do, been doing the comparison between like football, NFL, college football, basketball, college basketball or even the pros and I said I think basketball is more of a contact sport than football is it's still some safety parameters with your padding you know jersey your helmet with football but basketball you all out there exposed and you know like if you got some hard-nosed defenders like a Patrick Beverly who will be all up on you that's gonna be a problem he's gonna put himself at a huge risk of getting COVID out there on the court um so it's going to be interesting to see what they decide in the next week or two if they move forward because it's getting close to that July mark where training camps will have to start up if they're going to be ready for the end of July to get started. So um, I guess we'll just have to see. We'll have to see with these parameters. But those numbers going up in Florida, that's not a good look to try and get a season restarted or start a new season. Nah. I agree. I think everybody you know, got caught up in a lot of the other issues, but I think the biggest issue is going to be safety in florida and orlando and specifically i think i don't know if you noticed but uh their nwsl soccer team just pulled out of the league because they mm. had some people on their team um 
tested positive for COVID in the Orlando, the Orlando area team. Wow. So in that, that area, professional sports players and specifically have had issues. So um, yeah. I just don't know if the NBA is going to be able to pull it off. Because when you look at it, when you look at like the college players, Clemson, 23 players tested positive and they've been in quarantine with their families. And granted, they didn't get it while on campus, but now they're on campus and trying to put the parameters to quarantine. That's going to be hard. You know, get the NBA is just like, we're just going to tell you to leave. You're going to have to leave our bubble if you get it. I'm assuming the WNBA is going to do something similar. But that's still going to be hard because at some point they were around other people and they exposed other people. And the major concern is people who are asymptomatic, which I think a lot of athletes will be because, you know, they're in great shape. So they're not going to feel the same effects or have the same type of risk factors like older individuals who've contracted the disease have or the the warning signs. So that's going to be very interesting to see how that works out. But all of that sounds good until LeBron gets it or Kawhi gets it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no. If one of those guys get it, you can't tell me they're just going to kick them out. It's impossible. You're right about that because people would definitely stop watching. And they would not be interested if one of the stars of the league contracts COVID. So that's going to be interesting. And it's something that is going to be ongoing. This is our new normal for a while until we can get everything balanced out because it's going to be another uh, incline in a uh, positive test in the next couple of months. And we're already seeing the levels in Florida, in Georgia. It's a slow increase, but it's going to continue in the next couple of months. And we just have to be mindful. You can't play basketball with a mask. <laughs> Tell me, I tried it. I tried working out. It is hard. It's hard. <laughs> you can't breathe and it's hot. It's just uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. So we'll see what happens. But I wanted to talk about like, you know, during this time, like we're starting to get, People starting to feel comfortable again, going outside, um, which I think the CDC recommends if you have to get out or if you want to get into some you know, spaces around people, it's best to be outside so you can social distance rather than being in, in enclosed spaces. But we, we don't really talk about the mental health aspects of how people are being affected by COVID and being shut in since March and starting to get out. But, you know, a lot of people are still afraid to try and adventure out a bit because of the spikes we're starting to see in the numbers again. Um, And I was just reading like on the CDC website and they were just listed like, be kind to your mind, just some coping mechanisms to handle stress during COVID. And um, some of them were like, just pause, you know, breathe, notice how you feel, uh, take breaks from COVID content. Cause you know, well, since Black Lives Matter, the movement started with these social injustices and we've been seeing, especially since the murder of George Floyd, you don't see COVID content as much. But I know that was something that was heavy for a while on the news 24-7. And um, make time to sleep and exercise. I know over this break, that's something I've had to make it a daily routine or at least four or five times a week just trying to get some exercise in just to clear my mind. And then just reaching out to people trying to stay connected, like, during COVID Zoom, that platform picked up heavily. Um, you know, right now we are on StreamYard. Look, you know, people are using this. We can't be in studio, Skype, other avenues just to continue communication or shows that you can't go in studio or the normal uh, routine you would see in just different types of uh, platforms. And then just seeking help if you're overwhelmed. Like some people just don't want to even ask for it. And I think it was big because I think um, for the ESPYs last night, Kevin Love, I think he got the Arthur Ashe Award for his um, his activism and for mental health and just bringing awareness to it that I think has been probably a, a major issue amongst professional athletes. I mean, you know the stress levels they go through, and especially with Kevin Love and the likes playing with LeBron James in Cleveland for a few years where they were competing for championships, that level of stress to just continue to be uh, great and, and just try and uh, compete for championships year in, year out. That can that can take a toll on your mind, your body, but it's just so important to just I think take breaks and just try and reflect and don't let the stress overwhelm you so much. So how have you been handling stress during this time? Well, I think um, you know, as far as the general public, the two everyone's been affected. There's a lot of anxiety, um, just a lot of confusion because you know, again, it's a whole nother show, but I just feel like from the top down, we have no game plan, we have no strategy. And we have so much misinformation 
that people are confused and don't know what to believe, what not to believe. So that can stress you out in itself because you just don't know what's true and what's false and what can really, which ways you can really contract it. And if you can get it multiple times, like no one knows, which is crazy that we have all these intelligent doctors and scientists and all these platforms to spread information, but we haven't chose to do it in a way where everyone has a uh, kind of a set game plan or a set idea of what's going on where you have countries like South Korea and you have countries like Greece, where everyone's gotten on the same page with their um, testing, you know, mass testing in general, contact tracing, everyone's wearing masks. Um, they had a lockdown, a severe lockdown to start it out with early. So they kind of jumped ahead of it and it, it didn't spread like wildfire like it did here, uh, where we became far by far and away the worst country as far as uh, the disease contracted and, and deaths, which is crazy. You know, we're supposed to be mm -hmm. the top country in the world, but we handled it the worst. But again, sorry to jump off on a tangent. I had to get on my soapbox for a second. Um, but the general public, um, the older population yeah. and the younger population, I think have been affected the most. Um, if I was if I was older and had any underlying issues, I would be terrified to go out and just having to sit at home and not see your family which I think is what older people want to do is spend time with their children, their mm -hmm. grandchildren, their friends, and just enjoy themselves. And now they're um, kind of just stuck in their home and they're watching TV, yeah. you watching the news, and you just get more and more scared. And if you're young, you want to be outside playing with your friends. Um, you might not sp specifically like school and doing the work, but you do enjoy going socially to see your friends. And that was taken away from you. Yeah. Um, sometimes you're just with your family. You don't get to see your friends. So I think it's been very tough on those two. Uh, if you want to go on an athletic standpoint with what Kevin Love said, I think that's probably been a big issue for years. Um, they have so much pressure to perform and so many people that depend on them. Um, that, and, and you can be perceived as weak if you ask for help and you have any mental issues and you have any anxiety that a lot of them have probably just uh, kept everything in. Um, and not and not allowed themselves to get any help and just stress themselves out and, and made themselves um, even though they were doing so well monetarily and they might have even been performing well on the court. Um, I'm sure their lives seem like a living hell. So it's great that Kevin Love came out and spoke out. And I'm um, hopefully more guys will ask for help now. And I know a lot of college programs even and I'm sure NBA programs are providing you with healthcare professionals, mental health professionals um, who you can see. Um, and everyone doesn't have to know if you're not comfortable, uh, but so that these guys can get help. Um, because they're just like everyone else. They're actually just on a bigger platform with more pressure. Right. I agree. Um, but it's so important because, you know, that focus, if you get so bogged down and you don't reach out, I think that's so critical in what the CDC said, reach out, reaching out to somebody, you know, whether it's just a teammate or just acknowledging that you need help before you go and see a mental health professional to address it is just so important because if you don't have your mental health or your sanity, you can't really go that far doing anything. Um, so that's going to be important. And I mean, I hope, you know, people, if it is anything, you know, mental health diagnosis, I know in my field of work or my line of work, I see it all the time. But it's just so important to really address it and, and, and you know, take it head on. You know, don't let it linger and, and fester to where it becomes a bigger problem and you just can't get a hand or get a, um, a hold of it. It may just be too late. Sure. Um, but I want to transition back because we we were talking about the NBA, but we didn't even talk about this new platform. If they do go forward with the league and, and what or what how it will be like um, coming back. So, what are your thoughts about how they're gonna play these last eight games of the season before they get into the playoffs? I'm still a little confused. I mean, I've read multiple articles that tried to explain it to me, but I don't have a full grasp of how those particular eight games are going to be played. Like yeah, who's playing who and why are they playing who? Because obviously everyone's not involved, so you're not playing the remainder of your regular schedule. Right. It's a readjusted schedule. And to readjust the schedule in games of such significance for the teams that are try are vying for playoffs, to me is a little bit unfair. Like what if you have more games against the Clippers or the Lakers? Right. Versus the Trailblazers. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's really not fair. And I'm sure they're going to try to maneuver it in a certain kind of way. I know that they want to get Zion in if they can. They will love for New Orleans to get in there if they can, uh, just for ratings and just for to have a new young star and a new face. It's pretty set on the East. The Wizards have mm -hmm. no chance. I don't even know why they're there. 
Um, so it's pretty much set on the east as far as one through eight. And the other thing I don't understand is, can you move in the one through eight spots or is it just for the spots below? I don't even think anyone's really explained that all the way. So like, are you set in one through seven and eight is the only one that you can jump to? Or can like if six and seven are close and they in those eight games, they lose the 16 loses more than the 17. Now it can flip flop vice versa. Like, I don't even fully understand that. Yeah, it's still not clear. But from what I was gauging is that they still don't count your regular se- your regular season record. But then these eight games and how they play out, I, I'm assuming you could move up. Like, say if it's a seven seed that ends up just getting hot and maybe winning seven out of the eight games and may progress up, you know, the standings for a playoff seeding. So I would assume so, but it's really not clear. You know, with No the, one's explained it, right? Yeah, yeah. No one's really explained it. All you know is that it's 22 teams that's returning, nine from the east, 13 from the west. Which is weird in itself. It is strange. But, like, I I do understand what you were saying with Zion. If they're at that 10th or 9th seed and they can play their way and either get to that 9th seed and get it close within the 8th seed within uh, less than four games, then next thing you know, you got another um, aspect of it. You got a play-in game, which we've never seen for the 8th spot. So I think that's interesting. But they're forced to do this whole format since they're trying to speed up and get the league going again and then go into the playoffs right away or soon. But I think it's it's coming off of piggybacking after the All-Star game. You know how competitive it was in the fourth quarter. We hadn't seen players yeah. really competing like that. But I think after I think Chris Paul, he talked to the commissioner and was like, hey, we need to change this format up, make it more competitive for the fans, just not showboating which I enjoy watching that. And maybe this is just another aspect of them trying to make the league competitive to where, you know, when the playoffs start, that's always going to be competitive, but make the end of the regular season competitive to show that teams have something to, to really work for, to push for, to make a run to see if they can get into the playoffs or at least get that eighth seed. So I think it's interesting, um, but I'm like you, they need to explain it a little bit more. So you have some better understanding about how teams can move up and progress to get better seeding for the playoffs uh, rather than just the eighth and ninth seeds. That's really all you see about explanations regarding that. The only focus. That's the only one that I'm certain about is the eighth and ninth possibilities and what happens if they're close. That's the only thing I fully understand. I don't really understand anything else. Right, right, right. Cause you know, my lake show going to keep the number one seed. So I ain't even worried about that in the West. We don't have <laughs> enough time in the show for this. <laughs> oh man. So, you know, that's going to be interesting. So, let, I mean, with all this stuff going on, you know, we're a little behind, but, you know, we've had some athletes intertwining, interjecting with the whole Black Lives Matter movement and just, you know, giving some input about either they're for us. I think the whole platform, either for us or against us at this point. But just some people, some of the athletes speaking out and, and showing a little bit of their privilege or that white privilege that they've been accustomed to since they were born and act like they're just not familiar with when they open their mouths and try and make statements. And I know a couple of weeks ago, we had Drew Brees making some statements, this whole controversy with Cap, Colin Kaepernick, you know, taking a knee, he was doing it, hadn't played in the league since uh, he left the 49ers. And, you know, he said from the get-go why he was doing it. It was not a matter of disrespecting the flag, not a matter of disrespecting veterans. He even talked to, uh, former military or veterans, people in the military to just get some input. And, you know, they said that was actually a way to salute fallen soldiers when you took a knee. And he was just taking a knee for the fallen Black Americans, fallen soldiers who have died in this whole movement uh, due, to, due to police brutality or just racism in general in this country. So, you know, you had Drew Brees kind of get on his high horse a few weeks ago and got a lot of backlash about his comments that were very privileged, in my opinion, saying that it's totally disrespectful to take a knee for the flag, for people who fought for this country, his grandfather and other relatives. And I, I, did he just not get what, what Kaepernick was saying? That's not even what it was about. I mean, where did that even come from? What were your thoughts about that one? Well, I think that um, the media did a great job controlling the narrative. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people aren't even really familiar with what Colin Kaepernick, what his goal was and what he was speaking on, um, which is unfortunate. But now he looks like someone who was truly ahead of his time 
and he looks ingenious to be honest with you yeah uh, because what he was trying to talk about i think it's four years ago now yeah um today in 2020 has become a huge ordeal and the main thing that's being talked about on a daily basis by you know all walks of life uh, and he was trying to bring it to light then and potentially some of these lives could have been saved if someone would have been open-minded or if the media would have been open-minded and listened to what he was trying to say uh, and how he was trying to do it. And I thought he did it in a very peaceful way uh, and actually was very thoughtful in his explanations and intentional about what he said. But people turned it into something totally different. And again, I think it started with the administration and the owners um, who are all kind of intertwined um and they wanted to turn it into something negative because they didn't want that to be brought to attention right uh, what to me the definition of systematic racism is um when things are any time in history when these things have been brought up besides 2020 i got to give credit to 2020 and i think it's only because we're in a pandemic right I think being in a pandemic has been huge for the movement because like i said earlier in this uh, podcast, the fact that we're not distracted with our everyday lives, um, the hustle and bustle, um, the the grind of work, the grind of being around, going out, doing different things. And then obviously sports, which is huge, betting, gambling. Um, without those things, we've been forced to sit still and pay attention to issues that usually are swept under the rug. So when someone tries to bring those things out and bring them to light, unfortunately, they're silenced. Uh, banished or killed. Um, yeah. and in this case, Kaepernick was banished out of the NFL. Um, but now, fortunately for us, um, he looks like a genius. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I think he lost four years of football, and I'm not sure if he'll ever play again. Yeah, and now you see Roger Goodell even stepping up and changing his whole uh, totally thought process. Totally he just he did a 180, yeah. you know, the owners. But, I, you know, transitioning from that, I think the key was – that commercial that came out around that time or just a couple of weeks ago where you had the likes of just black faces of the NFL, you know, stepping up and saying black lives matters. Um, and the main one was Patty, my homeboy, you know, Patrick Mahomes stepping up and saying it. And when you think about it, this is the first time, this is not a Tom Brady league uh, driven league where you have a, a white man. That's the face of the league. Now you have a black man as a quarterback. And I thought that was huge by doing that commercial that it took or forced Roger Goodell to take a step back to say, if I, I know these are the faces that's, that are the faces of my league and generating big money for not only this league, but for the owners, we got to step up and say something because he was quiet all this time when Kaepernick was so-called washed up in their opinion and about to be cut by the 49ers. And uh, they didn't want to give him a voice. They just painted negativity behind it. So I think it validates him in a huge way. Um, it just shows the importance and the courage he had to use his platform and probably lose tons of money. I mean, I don't think he's hurting for money um, since yeah. this movement, but he, he put himself out there and it's a huge risk because he did lose his occupation. Um so I just think that was key. And I sometimes it's you want to say a little too late, but the movement or what is it's causing the NFL to do, like they said, they're going to over the next 10 years uh, donate $250 million to social or black causes, organizations just to bring awareness to social injustice. That's huge. You know, you got the likes of Michael Jordan stepping up. And when's the last time before? I mean, don't get me wrong. I was watching his uh, documentary on his 30 for 30. That was fantastic. But you never heard Michael Jordan really step up and speak on social injustice issues. And, you know, now his Jordan brand, you know, donating 100 million over the next 10 years. So we always talk about the privileged ones, but it's the, the people in the majority with the money that we need their help. We need their voices because sometimes just little of us is not going to be enough. But you're right. I think this pandemic has forced us to sit down, reflect, and pay attention because we can't do anything, no sports. Um, it's all over social social media. Like if this was about 10, 15 years ago, 
it wouldn't have nearly the amount of, t- of, t- of attention because we just have so many different outlets. If it was last year, you're right about that. But I'm just like between social media, between the pandemic right now and just no sports or nothing going on that can really take away from the focus of the movement. It's been very important. And I think that's why it's so important to keep up with the progression. You know, we have all these different protests. I've been out there at least three or four times just going to different peaceful protests around the city. I hate how the media and some news outlets try and just focus on the negative right now. Statues, our Confederate statues being burned or should turned have over. Years ago, though. But it's like, that's not the focus. It should have happened. They should have been taken down. But the negativity or if you see the looting, we don't need to focus on that. You know, focus is it's much more peaceful demonstrations going on in this country that they need to focus on to keep the attention on the on the right things and the things that matter. And right now we got to get the agenda going to really talk about where we need to be or where we want to go moving forward to continue to make change and, and, and to improve this country and to make the white majority understand and be aware of what it means to be a black man or woman in America. I think that's so important. So it's needed. Is needed. I agree. I agree. And unfortunately, I just think that, you know, if it if it doesn't impact you on a day to day basis, it's hard for you to understand and see it um, mm-hmm. but as grueling and as brutal as it's been. And it's really hard for me to watch any of these murders, um, whether it's a Mar- Marbury being Marbury being hunted down in the streets by two civilians um, on the back of their truck with shotguns or um, George Floyd um, Chauvin's knee on his neck just to see it it it, it gives me chills but what it's done is for white america to see that these things really are happening and i don't think that they understood because they've never been pulled over and harassed by the police they've never been shot at by the police when they were unarmed so if you don't see it and you don't feel it and you don't understand it then how can you um be frustrated by it. So right. I understood like if you don't see it on a day to day basis, and you don't understand it. It's nothing you can do. But now these things have been brought to light. And I think that we have come together as a country and realize that it's wrong. But now we have to put a plan in place um, with the proper judges, the proper laws, uh, the proper district attorneys um, so that right. we can change laws that control these actions. And there will be repercussions if you do it. I and agree. I think- I think it started with charging the police with felony murder um, in the Rashad Brooks case. I know a lot of police don't aren't happy about it, but let me tell you this. A police would think two times, three times, four times about shooting somebody now if they're unarmed. Yeah. Because they know now there's a chance they can get charged with felony murder. It's never happened before. Yeah. Now I you agree. will not just be a wild, reckless policeman. You will be very conscious of your decision. You will be very thoughtful in everything that you do because you know that something very serious could be coming down the pipe if you make those decisions, which yeah. is important. It's very important. And I never want to downplay a police officer's job. It's hard enough. I mean, they're, they're supposed to serve and protect And Sometimes you don't know what you're doing when you're going out there, who you may be facing. At the end of the day, a lot of these officers have families they want to go back home to. So it, it's a, it's a judgment call that you have to make, you know, in an instant. Um, but at the same time, It needs to be proper training. It needs to be more accountability. And you're correct. It starts with your local cities, municipalities, the legislation you get passed, the councilmen, uh, the mayors, the police chiefs, how they get appointed, the district attorneys, like you said, your um, local state or, you know, state representatives who you who you elect locally by uh, using your right to vote is so important. We're so caught up in the national election and Donald Trump, which is very important. Um, but at the same time, we don't even get there until we handle what's going on in our own communities. So I think that's important. And moving forward, we have to continue to bring awareness. And I think this is a good platform where we could just put stuff out there. You know, as we know, when elections or things are happening, just address it. Make people aware so they know what's going on and uh, they can be informed. Or like people say, they can be woke because it's important. You can't just be living out here acting like you don't know anything. It's too many ways. And so you can, it's so many things to like the media is so accessible where you can find anything out. 
So we got to keep that going, keep the narrative going in the movement and start coming up with some strategies to start fixing the problem in America, especially in black America and how blacks are treated. I agree. Yeah. Well, shoot, Dave D Lab, this has been a great session tonight. Um, you know, this is our first podcast and I've enjoyed it. You know, we hope that we're gonna have plenty of people listening and tuning in, make this a weekly thing and just hit on these topics to address them. And hopefully we'll start having some guests on here to start talking as well. But I think this is a good first first show for us. I good agree. One. I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. So I appreciate you, D-Lab. Let's keep it going. Um, to anybody that's listening, streaming this, we appreciate your support, uh, your viewership, and we're going to keep it going. So stay tuned.